OK, all right, so let's get started. Um, Paul CBUA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and territorial traditional territories of First Peoples. In Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatkavut, and the Innu of Natasinan, the Beothic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. In Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. In New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wolasta Kwayek, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples. We at Call C CBUA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the First Peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us. So good afternoon. My name is Erin McPherson and I'm the Research and Instruction Librarian at Dalhousie University on the McRae campus in Truro. On behalf of CAL, CBUA, the Digital Preservation Stewardship Committee, and our partners ACENET and Endrio Portage, I would like to welcome you to the 2021 CAL CBUA Research Data Management Series. The Frank Frankization of the event is made possible through the collaboration of the members of the Research Data Management Working Group of the Bureau de la Cooperation Interuniversitaire, BCI. Special thanks to our organizers, Margaret Vale, St. FX, Cynthia Lise, UQUAM, Cynthia Holt, Call CBUA, Louise Gillis, Dal, Allison Farrell, Mun, Lydia, Vermidin, Acenet, Jennifer Abel, Andrio, Jonathan Dory, INRS, and Victoria Volkanova, UD Moncton. The session is being recorded and will be available after the presentation on the CALL CBUA website. Attendees will be muted upon joining. We ask that you do remain muted when not speaking. If you have technical problems, please put them in the chat box during the main presentation. At the bottom of the screen, or maybe at the top of your screen, it's the top of mine, um, are options to control your microphone, camera, and to access the chat. You can also turn on closed captioning by clicking on the three dots and selecting closed captioning. Please be, remember to be kind, courteous, and respectful of the presenters and other attendees. I'd now like to introduce Margaret Vale, who will be speaking on where to deposit your data, Dataverse, Furter, or other. Margaret Vale is the Systems Librarian uh, at St. FX University, um, and she's joining us today. Margaret. Thank you, Erin. Um, are you able to hear me and see my first slide? Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, so hi, as Erin mentioned, my name is Margaret Vale, and I am the Systems and Data Services Librarian at St. Francis Xavier University. Today, I will be talking to you about where you can deposit your data. This is the third webinar in the Call Research Data Management series. I will go over, in today's presentation, I will go over what is a research data repository, uh, data repository types, how to choose a data repository, special types of data, data repositories at your institution, and resources. And at the very top of my outline, I forgot to mention a brief mention of the tri-agency policy. So CAL stands for the Council of Atlantic University Libraries and is comprised of all academic libraries in Atlantic Canada. Uh, this is a list of our CAL member institutions. I would also like to extend welcome to our colleagues from across Canada. Uh, this is just a selection of, of, of institutions and universities um, where people have registered to attend today's event. So if I missed yours, I apologize. Uh, the tri-agency RDM policy has been coming for several years now. Um, we first heard about this in 2016 um, when the tri-agency released a statement of principles on da digital data management. In 2018, they released a draft policy um, and then consulted with various stakeholders and communities in 2018 as well. Uh, in March 2021, the tri-agency released their um, final research data management policy. The um, released policy uh, includes three components, institutional strategy, institutional strategies, uh, data management plans, and data deposit. Uh, the 
Institutional strategies will be written by every uh, institution that receives tri-agency grant funding, uh, and the deadline for that will be May March 1st, 2023. Um, some grants already require the data management plans, uh, and Aaron McPherson and Louise Gillis kindly talked about data management plans in their uh, in the second webinar in this series, so you can go back to the call website and view the recording, um, hopefully within a few days. And the third component is data deposit, and this is what I am going to be talking to you about today. Uh, there is currently no deadline on when data deposit is going to be um, mandatory. Uh, the tri agencies plan on uh, re investigating this when the institutional strategies are completed uh, for March 1st, 2023. This is just me highlighting that today's presentation is focusing on data deposit. So what is a research data repository? Let's begin by considering the research data lifecycle uh, where we will plan, create, process, analyze, disseminate, preserve, and reuse data. During the planning phase, you want to decide on a, an appropriate research data repository. You should also consider when choosing that repository um, what data or how much data you will deposit and how you will prepare that data for sharing, uh, preservation and reuse. A repository is an online database service, an archive that manages the long term storage and preservation of digital resources and provides a catalog for discovery and access. Research data repositories provide sound data management throughout the data lifecycle by storing and enabling access to deposited data sets in a range of formats, which are also curated to enable their discovery and reuse. The network of the National Library of Medicine defines a data repository as a place that stores data, makes data available for use, and organizes data in a logical manner. A data repository can be a general or subject specific location where research can, researchers can deposit their data with the intent to share and or preserve the data. Uh, some funders such as the tri agency require or will require data from funded research to be to be deposited in a data repository and some journal publishers require that data associated with a published journal article also be made available in a data repository. So why do we want to use a data repository um, instead of other data storage methods? Well, unlike file hosting services such as Dropbox or hosting data on a website, research data repositories do things to help make research data accessible and usable for the long term. For example, data repositories have a mandate and plan for preservation, even if the repository stops operating or file formats become obsolete. They offer information about the data set that enables people to discover and learn about the data. They provide either direct access or information on access conditions to potential users of the data, and they ensure each data set has a persistent web link that will always take people to information about the data set, which can be cited in publications. Uh, some additional benefits of using a research repository um, is long-term access and preservation. Many repositories can store data and make it available over the long term. Discovery and reuse. Other researchers can find and reuse your data more, more easily. Uh, data citations in DOI. Both you and other researchers can easily cite your data with the persistent identifier. Um, it also meets funding and publishing requirements as many funders and publishers now require data to be deposited in a repository. There are many reasons why there are different types of research data repositories. Um, some of these are different repositories reflect the interests and needs of their communities. Some repositories specialize in specific types of research data, uh, for example, quantitative data, qualitative data, or source code. Repositories have different restrictions on sharing data, uh, such as commercial repositories versus open repositories. 
they have it re different restrictions on metadata, file size, format, etc. And they have different restrictions on the length of time they will preserve the data. Not every repository will store the data indefinitely or have a preservation layer. Some repositories like Figshare or Zenodo are general repositories that accept a range of data. Other repositories may have different policies on what they accept. Uh, disciplinary specific repositories cover a specific subject area like social science data. Uh, location specific repositories collect data on or by researchers from a particular country or region. And other repositories may focus on specific types of data such as audio or video. So the main types of research data repositories are institutional, national, discipline specific, source code, multidisciplinary, and project specific. Institutional data repositories are used by researchers who are affiliated with a specific institution, um, such as the university or government. They store a wide variety of research data types. They may include analysis and other supplementary information, and they meet uh, funder guidelines. So some examples in Canada of institutional data repositories would be the University of Prince Edward Island's um, data. Uh, University of New Brunswick um, uses Dataverse and Scholars Portal is a Dataverse that I will talk a bit more about later um, that's based out of the Ontario University Library collaboration and has expanded beyond that to um, cover many universities across Canada. Another type of institutional uh, of, of repository that you may already be familiar with is institutional research repositories. And I put research in brackets here because institutional repositories have traditionally been separate from data. Um, you can still use them to deposit data, but their main purpose is to collect uh, the intellectual research output of that institution. So some examples that you might be familiar with would be um, DALSpace at Dalhousie University, uh, TSpace at the University of Toronto, uh, StateFX recently launched StateFX Scholar in the last few years. Uh, UBC has Circle and UPEI has Island Scholar. National data repositories are for researchers who are affiliated with a specific country. Uh, so it's, for example, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia. Uh, they store a wide variety of research data types and they may include analysis and other supplementary information. Uh, these national repositories uh, often meet funder guidelines as well. So some examples would be the Australian National Data Service, uh, the UK Data Service, and in Canada we have FERDER, which is the Federated Research Data Repository. Um, some disciplines um, have discipline-specific repositories. Usually these disciplines have um, had these repositories around for a, a lot longer than um, funders um, have been requiring data repositories. Uh, so they can be smaller in scope, but they are broadly supported and recognized in their respective research communities, uh, usually because they have been well established for many years. Uh, they attract an audience in a particular field, and the data cur curation and preservation depends on that specific area of research. So some examples would be um, Pan Pangea, which is the Earth and Environmental Science Data Repository, Ag Econ, which is Agricultural and Applied Economics, and I think it says ArcVix, might be how they say it, and it's a repository for physics data. And I also believe ArcVix also does um, journal articles as well. Um, if you come from a technical background, uh, you may already be familiar with source code repositories. Uh, they are used a lot by um, software development companies and technical companies, but they are also can be really useful for um, research as well. If you are writing code to develop or to analyze your data, um, this is a really good repository option. Since they have special features for, specifically for code, such as version control and bug tracking. 
Um, these also allow for, allow for easy collaboration, not only between team members, but with the outside community as well. Because anyone, um, if you leave your code open, anyone else can copy your code and um, continue to add on to it or expand it for their own needs. Source code repositories often use the freemium model, which means that the, a lot of base features are available for free, um, but they charge for their advanced features and um, even higher storage capacity. So some examples of source code repositories would be GitHub, GeForce, and Bitbucket. I'm oh, sorry, GeForge. Uh, in addition, we, there's also multidisciplinary repositories. Um, some examples would be Figshare, Lab Archives, or Zenodo. Um, other data repositories out there would be commercial repositories, and they provide a fee-based service uh, based on factors such as the size of the data stored. And there's also project-specific data repositories, and they are intended for data per pertaining to a specific research project. Uh, the the example um, provided in my notes is scientific drilling database, um, but there's also some more local databases or local data repositories such as the Ocean Tracking Network out of Dalhousie University. So now that we know that there are many different types of data repositories, how do we choose a data repository for your data? Well, before choosing a data repository, ask yourself the following questions. What options, if any, does my institution already have? All of your institutions either have somebody that's already familiar with research data management and um, data deposit options, or they are developing that capacity. Um, so if you're not sure who you should contact, I have some information further down the slides, but contacting your um, academic library is a great place to start, as well as maybe the research office. Um, who is the audience for your data? Are there any grant limitations or obligations? And is this data, is this a trusted re data repository? Are there any institution country specific requirements for my data when collaborating with international researchers? Is the data repository fair? Uh, and this was mentioned, this was talked more about in the first uh, webinar in this series. Uh, FAIR is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. FAIR contains a set of 15 guiding principles that defines the properties of data and metadata. Um, they're also based on a set of 14 metrics have that, that have been defined to quantify levels of fairness in data. Is the data repository trustworthy? And I hope everyone's groaning because I did that on purpose. Uh, trust describes the characteristics of data repositories that are responsible for storing data over a long period of time. These characteristics are transparency, responsibility, user focus, sustainability, and technology. Uh, some tips for defining fair and trustworthy repositories. You want to look for a defined policy or terms of use, um, citation creation, uh, if they're using persistent identifiers such as DOI. Another type of persistent identifier that you may hear about is also called handle. Um, for example, a lot of DSpace instances uh, for institutional repositories will use a handle instead of a DOI. Uh, they are both persistent identifiers and equally um, good options. Uh, you want to make sure that there is standard metadata. Um, access controls are available. Licensing options. Uh, so some data, some research data repositories will let you choose a licensing option, and there are a few that will say anything deposited in our um, repository has to have like a Creative Commons zero license, which means that anyone can access and use reuse your data for any reason. So it is important to take a look at what licensing options are available um, for the repositories that you're interested in. Um, they also include metrics and the ability to index the data um, to assist with discovery. 
other considerations that I wanted to talk more about, um, but this is still a very new area um, for a lot of people, is sensitive data, um, which includes personally identifiable data, Indigenous data, and health data. Um, a lot of the data repositories that exist right now um, are not capable of handling sensitive data, um, so you would be responsible for de-identifying the data before it is um, added to the repository. And again, this is something that is um, currently really big in the uh, research data management community and a lot of people and a lot of working groups have been struck to try and identify solutions uh, for sensitive data. Um, qualitative data is also another consideration. Um, a lot of the uh, current and older data repositories are designed to work really well with quantitative data. It doesn't mean that you can't put qualitative data in it, um, but you just also need to be more careful of um, sensitive data when you're working with qualitative data as well. Uh, when you're depositing your data within a research data repository, the repository will outline what, you, what your data should deposit should include. In general, you want your data deposit to include the data itself, but you want to make sure that the files will be stored in widely adopted, well-documented and non-proprietary formats. So an example would be um, if you are using an Excel spreadsheet to work on your data, um, that the Excel, the Excel spreadsheet would be a proprietary data form format, so you would want to convert your data into a CSV or a text file. Uh, there's also um, a lot more examples of that too, like with Word documents and then um, the Word file being the proprietary. Um, even there's even become a lot of issues with um, PDFs and PDFAs um, being a proprietary format. Um, so it's always best practice to um, have different your data available in different formats. You want to make sure that your documentation is well developed. You want to have code books, user guides and readme files to help users understand and be able to reuse your data correctly. And you want to make sure that there is good descriptive metadata so that it will help people find and use your data. Um, this information is required to understand the data and use the data um, to create citations, um, the project scope and terms use licensing information. Uh, a lot of the librarians are here at all of your institutions are um, here to help you with the descriptive metadata. So if you find that you need assistance in this area, um, please feel free to contact your library, your research data management librarian or uh, the, the general library to find out who you should be talking to. And I do have a slide further down um, on how you can find these appropriate people at your own institutions. Um, that being said, there are a couple different types of data repositories that I want to focus on. Um, the first one is Dataverse. And the reason why I'm focusing on Dataverse is that um, a large portion of attendees at this event um, are from institutions that are using a Dataverse data repository. Uh, what is Dataverse? Dataverse is built with open source software and allows users to share data openly. It has tools to allow users to visualize and explore data, to explore summaries and visualizations of variables within a data set, um, all within the web browser. Dataverse supports the creation of custom terms of use and restrictions in order to control access to research data. It facilitates long-term access, persistent identifiers, and preservation by storing a backup copy for safekeeping. By depositing in Dataverse, researchers can receive academic credit credit and recognition by making data more discoverable to the research community. Uh, users can collaborate in teams and track changes as Dataverse provides increased user control over managing changes to a project. So the question is, who uses Dataverse? And I actually find this a very 
interesting question because I've given a similar presentation for the past three years. And every time I go to the Dataverse metric website, the most popular subject area that uses Dataverse has changed. So in 2011, the most popular uh, field that used Dataverse was medicine, health and life sciences. In 2020, it was genetic resources. And in 2019, it is social sciences. So you can see that pretty much every discipline uses Dataverse. And I also wanted to throw in some um, more statistics as well. Um, so we have medicine. In 2021, uh, we have medicine and health sciences at 55%, social sciences at 18%, arts and humanities at 9%, earth and environmental sciences at 5.5, law, which is a new one because it hadn't appeared in the previous years, at 2.6, um, agricultural science, computer and information, engineering, physics, chemistry. Uh, the other really interesting thing to come out of this is that I also have some back numbers from previous years, so you can really see how these have changed. So although social sciences in 2020 um, had 18% and oh, it's still 18% this year, but they had 22.8 thousand data sets in 2020 and this year they have increased it by almost 10,000 data sets to 33.2. So I'm not going to go into too much of these details, but if it's interesting to you, um, I put it in the slides and you can take a look at it uh, yourself after. Margaret, this is Erin. Sorry to interrupt. Um, can I just ask a quick question? Are those metrics for uh, Dataverse in Canada or for internationally? Uh, that's a very good question. I did get this from the Harvard Dataverse site, so it is the statistics for Dataverse um, across the world, and I believe that Dataverse um, on the Harvard site um, uses these metrics from and harvests them from other Dataverse institutions. Does that sound right to you, Erin? Yes. Thanks. I do want to talk a little bit about Dataverse terminology because if you're one of those institutions that are using Dataverse, the terminology is the most confusing part. So you will hear the word Dataverse all the time. So that's why I kind of came up with this title, Dataverse versus Dataverse. So we have the Dataverse project, which is the open source software created at Harvard University. And then inside Dataverse, which is the software, you have collections, also called a Dataverse. So let's use um, Scholars Portal Dataverse as an example. Um, Scholars Portal is Ontario's. Um, of course, I'm going to draw a blank, but it's Ontario's um, Association of University Libraries um, have come together to develop their own um, technology group to support technologies within their institutions instead of replicating um, all of the technological um, requirements at every single institution. So we have Scholars Portal, which has a Dataverse, and that Dataverse is a software, and it's also the name of the website. And we also have Dataverses within Scholars Portal Dataverse. So we have Cape Breton University Dataverse, Dalhousie University Dataverse, Memorial University Dataverse, and St. FX Dataverse. And this is why it gets really confusing because all of these Dataverses exist within Scholars Portal Dataverse. And then versus Dataverse, again. So Dataverses themselves can have more Dataverses. So Cape Breton University can have uh, our research project or team Dataverse number one, uh, number two, and number three um, to number N. Um, Memorial University can also have um, sub Dataverses. So to recap, I try thinking about it like this. You have Dataverse, 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 or you can consider it the software name or the website 
the collection, and then the subcollection. That all have the same name. And this is the official diagram that uh, Dataverse has on their website. Um, so Dataverse is a container for data sets and or additional Dataverses. So it's a container for a data set or Dataverse as a subcollection. Um, the data set is the container for your data, documentation and code. So more about Scholar's Portal Dataverse. Um, some features include Canadian hosting. Scholar's Portal Dataverse is completely hosted on servers at the University of Toronto Libraries. Uh, they have visualization tools um, available for looking at tabular data files, um, and it allows you to explore the full list of variables conveniently through your web browser without any extra software. Uh, it provides persistent identifiers to help increase the impact of your research. Uh, Dataverse assigns digital object identifiers, or DOIs, um, provided through Datacite Canada to your research data. Scholars Portal Dataverse is discoverable and it feeds into the share notification system to increase discoverability of your data set. And Dataverse also uh, connects with ORCID identifiers to link your data to your online scholarly record. Dataverse is bilingual, so it's available, uh, sorry, Scholars Portal Dataverse is bilingual, so it's available in both English and French. And it's also, um, it also is used for many institutional dataverses. So many data many institutions across Canada use Dataverse as their institutional data repository. Sorry, they use Scholars Portal Dataverse as their institutional repository. So Dataverse is Scholars Portal data, Dataverse is free to you as a researcher if you are at a participating institution. One major flaw of Dataverse is that it cannot hold confidential private or other legally protected information, such as personally identifiable information, um, possibly indigenous data, and definitely health data, if there's any um, personal identifiable information in it. So I went through the list of all of the uh, universities that use uh, Scholars Portal Dataverse and I compared it to attendees who signed up to attend this uh, presentation. So I just want to highlight that um, in the call institutions we have Cape Breton University, Dalhousie University, Memorial University, uh, St. Mary's and St. FX. Um, some other people who are attending, we have Concordia, McGill, McMaster, Ontario Tech University, Polytechnique Montreal, uh, Queen's University, University of Laval, UBC, U of Calgary, uh, Guelph, Toronto, Victoria, and York University. Another data repository um, is the Federated Research Data Repository, or FERDER. Uh, so this is a national repository and is available for any researcher at a affiliated with a university in Canada. Um, so there is a further was developed with a collaboration between Portage Compute Canada and the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. It is a single platform from which Canadian research can be ingested, curated, preserved, discovered, cited and shared. If you are a depositor, you would want to look at further if your institution doesn't have a Dataverse or if your file sizes are greater than 2.5 gigabytes. So in Dataverse, um, you are limited to a two, each file has to be less than 2.5 gigabytes. If you are a data seeker, you want to use further um, if you want to search all data in Canadian data repositories. Further not only stores data for um, researchers, it also um, 
collects all of the metadata in Canadian data repositories to provide one place to search and find all data available in Canada. Some other Canadian data repositories, I did just focus on call institutions for this um, slide, is the University of New Brunswick uses Dataverse, but they use a self-hosted version and not Scholars Portal. And the University of Prince, West, Prince Edward Island is using um, an Islandora variety for a research data repository. And just a little comparison chart so that we can see um, more information about all of these repositories. Um, your, in, your University of Dataverse will have no cost to you as the researcher or the user. Um, there is the 2.5 gigabytes per file limit, but you can, op you can upload multiple files. And if you're working with um, just text files or just numeric data, you likely will not encounter that 2.5 gigabyte per file limit. Um, further is free for researchers affiliated with a Canadian institution. Um, if you don't know whether to use uh, your local university um, data repository or further, um, a great option would be to talk to the appropriate librarian at your institution uh, and they should be knowledgeable enough to provide you with advice or if they um, are still learning about the research data management process, they will be familiar with people um, that they can ask and help provide you with the information you need. Um, some of the um, other services, such as Dryad, Figshare, and Zenodo, um, have fee systems, or, uh, yeah, they, a lot of these, they have to make money somewhere, so they either charge fees, um, I believe when I relooked at Dryad, they may not charge fees for if you are participating at a participating institution, which I believe were mainly American, or if you were depositing data um, that was related to a journal for a particular publication. Um, Figshare allows you to deposit um, one gig of data for no cost. And each individual file can be no larger than 250 megabytes for the no cost option. And then they um, begin to charge fees to um, be able to sustain the service. Uh, Zenodo has no fees and they do have a 50 gigabyte per data set limit. They do uh, encourage donations um, towards sustainability of their service. Another place you can look for research data repositories is re3data.org. Um, it provides a comprehensive database of research data repositories across the world, and you can search or browse by subject area, by geographic location, by licensing rules, by a lot of the things that we talked about today. So I'm going to quickly go over how you can find your RDM contact. At Acadia University, um, they do not have their own data repository, but they re recommend that they're at the moment, it's possible they will in the future. I apologize, I didn't ask that, so I haven't clarified. Um, but they recommend that their researchers use FERDER. Um, their RDM contact is Mike Beasley. Cape Breton University uses Scholars Portal Dataverse, and the RDM contact is Jasmine Hoover. Um, Dalhousie University uh, uses Scholars Portal Dataverse, and they have an RDM team uh, that share an email address uh, that you can contact. Memorial University uh, uses Scholars Portal Dataverse, and their RDM contact is Allison Farrell. St. Mary's University also uses Scholars Portal Dat Dataverse. Uh, their RDM contact is a team of people at St. Mary's, and you can email them directly. Um, at St. FX, we also use Scholars Portal Dataverse, and I'm the RDM contact. Uh, University of New Brunswick hosts their own Dataverse instance, and they have an RDM team um, to manage it. University of Prince Edward Island uses the Islandora Research Data Repository and their contact is Kim Mears. 
I have not contacted all of the call institutions, but the ones that I did, um, we have at Mount St. Vincent, you can contact Sanders Sawchuk at Nova Scotia Community College, uh, Trish LeBlanc at Université de Moncton, Victoria Volcanova. And Portage Network also maintains a list of contacts at universities across, RDM contacts at universities across Canada. So if you're not in a call institution, you can please just take a look at this link and find out who you should contact at your own institution. Um, so let's go through a, a demo of the Scholars Portal Dataverse. I'm just going to point out some things that you may find interesting and useful um, when you are um, looking at data repositories or evaluating them, or if you do want to go ahead and use Scholars Portal Dataverse. So this is what the um, what a list of Scholars Portal Dataverse looks like. And if you go directly to their web page, um, you will be given this page and then if you click on explore dataverse you're taken to the um, dataverse for you to browse you can also find out more information about dataverse explore as i mentioned or search dataverse for specific information uh, there is a top banner that shows you all of the participating institutions so you can scroll through and find uh, your own institution um, or one that you're particularly interested in. Uh, you can, again, you can search. Um, this is a search for this dataverse. So at, since we're at the top level, it will search all of the data, all of the content in the entirety of Scholars Portal Dataverse. However, if you were on a lower level, such as looking at Cape Breton University's Dataverse, you would search from that level and below. Uh, there is an advanced search feature which allows you to um, fill in more specific information. Uh, there is filters along the left hand side to help you refine your data. Uh, you can sort based on um, name, newest, oldest. You can view metrics. So this would be when Aaron asked earlier about um, what my metrics were before. These metrics are um, specific to the Scholars Portal Dataverse, whereas before um, the metrics were for all Dataverses across the world. Um, so this data set was taken um, last year. So last year you can see that Carleton University had the um, highest number of Dataverses, followed by the University of Toronto and then the University of British Columbia. Uh, University of Toronto had the largest amount of disk space used at 650 gigabytes, um, followed by Carleton University um, between 550 to 600 gigabytes. It also shows you, you can also see like what file types um, are in the repository. Um, so here we can see that we have text is the biggest proportion followed by PDF, applications, images, video, zip files, Excel. And then we can also see a breakdown of categories. So in the Scholars Portal Dataverse last year, 42% um, of categories subjects used was social sciences. So now this we are looking at the Carleton University Dataverse. So we're thinking about Carleton University as being a collection within Scholars Portal. Uh, we have contact information to contact someone at Carleton University. And we can also see the sub collections within Carleton University's Dataverse. Uh, again, I mentioned that you can search. Um, you're going to search from Carleton. If you use this search box, we will search from Carleton University and below. Um, again, we have filters and sort. Um, in the list, dataverses will be orange, so this would be a subcollection, and data sets are blue. I, if you have permission, you can add data. Um, some data librarians will 
provide direct access um, for researchers to uh, ingest their own data. Um, and some research data librarians will provide a curation service. So it's always best to check with the research data library at your institution to find out what is available. Um, there's also custom branding available. You can provide project descriptions, and this is, again is that you can search, filter, and sort um, within the subcollection of Carleton University. This is what a data set looks like. So we have the title, uh, the citation. Um, each data set can also collect its own metrics. So if you wanted to know um, how popular your data set is, you can come to the record for your data set and see that it, in this case, has 15 downloads. Um, we have description, subject, keywords, um, related publications. So if your data is related to a published article, you can add that citation information or link to the article. Um, and you can see the files that are available. Um, if the data is available in a tabular format, uh, you can click on Explore, which lets you look through the tabular data um, inside the web browser without downloading it to your computer. But if you wish to download it in other formats, um, that is available as well. The metadata tab contains um, more information and the terms tab will show you um, the rules on reuse of that data set. So in this case, this one is using um, Creative Commons license zero, which means that anyone can use the data for any purpose and they do not have to cite your data. Although citing data is always best practice. This chart is just showing you a quick overview of the different types of Creative Commons licenses. So you can see that CC zero um, public domain has permissions to copy. Um, they don't need to attribute, they can use it for commercial use, they can modify your data, and they can even change the license. Uh, Dataverse also has the option to collect a get to collect information about the people um, using your data. So if you if that was something you're interested in, uh, you can create a guest book. And in the guest book, you can say um, what kind of information you would like to collect from the people downloading it. Are you interested in their institution, uh, their name, their email, their position? You can ask them what are they intending to use the data for? And this could just could be useful metrics for yourself if you're trying to um, collect information maybe for uh, tenure and promotion. You can restrict files within Dataverse, but just because a file is restricted does not mean that it is a good option for your personally identifiable information. Um, so even if the data is restricted, it is not necessarily protected. So please keep that in mind. I mean, can, protected from, as in that it's safe to store personally identifiable information. It's still really safe, but just the rules for personally identifiable information are so strict that you don't want to put them in Dataverse as it is now. You can also um, keep track of versions. So if you update your data a year from now or a few weeks from now and you want to put in the most latest version of your data, um, you have that availability. And you can even add notes and set new version numbers and keep the older versions available as well. Uh, it even has the, a, tr a nice handy um, feature where you can even view the differences between your data and what you've changed. In this case, it looks like the change was in the um, description metadata, um, so you can see how the metadata changed between the two versions. Um, this is some of my references. I have to admit that I did not probably get them all into the slides, so I apologize for that. And now I'm ready to take any of your questions. So thank you, Margaret, uh, for your presentation. Um, if you have questions for Margaret, you can type them into the chat panel or you can use your, your human, your real voice. Um, <laughs> so thanks. Uh, Margaret, I had, there was one in the chat. Um, I answered part of it, but I wanted to see if you had anything to add. Um, Oh, yes, you will get the slides after actually the video as well. Um, so uh, Karen asked, is there any value or point in depositing in more than one repository? I did provide a brief answer like 
uh, repositories like FERTER index data from other repositories so they're more discoverable. Um, I'm not sure about depositing in multiple repositories because then you'd get two separate persistent identifiers. You? Yes, I don't think there would be any reason to deposit in more than one repository. Um, you would likely just want to spend more time up front to decide which is the best repository and some of the considerations that you would want to take into um, consideration is if that repository is um, indexed by other repositories. So. Like Aaron mentioned, further indexes um, data from other data repositories so that they're more discoverable. Um, I believe that there are more indexes in development to find these. And I think even data is starting to be indexed by Google. Now it's really hard to find them through Google, but it is still possible if you put in your exact citation for it to come up. But I would not recommend doing it in more than one place unless you had a specific reason to. Yeah, and um, Margaret, if I can just add to that as well, um, one of the things that's great about using a repository like Dataverse is that you get that persistent identifier. So if you have a researcher profile like ORCID or something like that, you can put it in there and promote it and really kind of get it out there um, that way. And it will link back to Dataverse. And so downloads, you'll still be able to track your downloads that way. So Dan, yeah, thanks, that was a great question. Um, are there any other questions? You can type them in or, or feel free to just ask. I do really appreciate having um, fellow data, research data librarians on the call to help answer questions. I know, it was pretty exciting to see people from all across Canada too. <laughs> um, so I, Yes, Margaret, if you, I, I don't see any other questions. Um, are, are you okay if we, we wrap, is everyone okay if we wrap up or? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so thank you everyone. Oh, share the link to the demo Dataverse. Yes, oh, yeah. we can do that. Oh, maybe there's a few more questions coming. Oh, Trish is so fast. Oh, no, that's different. That's the Google data set search. That's great. So uh, yes, the um, Margaret, would you mind putting the demo Dataverse one in the chat? Oh, yeah, they did already. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you're using Scholars Portal, there is a link to the demo Dataverse on the, uh, the, the home page, kind of. Um, but Margaret's going to put that in the chat now. But again, thank you everyone for attending. And we have one more uh, webinar in our series, and it is on uh, leveraging advanced digital research infrastructure to support research data management. And that is Thursday, November 18th. And I'm just gonna put that in the chat. And there was another question from Sophie about anywhere to store databases. Um, it was in the chat. Yeah, well, you can store a database if it, um, if your database is stored as a flat file, so you can usually um, export your database from whatever system you're hosting it in. So if you were using MySQL, uh, there's an option to export that database into a flat file, um, which can be imported into a new database system. Um, you can install, you can store that flat file, which is just essentially um, text data into any data repository as long as it meets the file size and the requirements. Um, again, we usually recommend using your, I don't know if this came through, but it's probably recommended to talk to your institutional data, research data re librarian um, because your institutional repository is most likely to be the best place to store that information. And if it's not, they'll be able to help you um, select an, a more appropriate place. Thank you. Um, thanks, Margaret. And just to add to that, if we can't help you, we have lots of colleagues across Canada who we're regularly in contact with, some of who are on this call also. <laughs> so, OK. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I just put a link to our next session on November 18th in the chat and hope to see a lot of you there. So have a great afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, everyone. 
I 